If I'm Lieutenant General Jan Hewley, United States Marines, retired. I am the successor to Major General Mike Myatt as the President and CEO of the Marines Memorial Association and the club. We're proud, we've got 20,000 members worldwide of the club and they're proud to honor at this event tonight. We are a charitable organization. We're more than just a hotel that puts on things. We're a charitable organization. We're a 501C19 veterans nonprofit and we're supported by a 501 nonprofit charitable organization. So those I would like to make sure that you're keeping in your mind because these presentations are made possible by the support, the attendance, and donations by folks like you. So if you're so inclined to help out in the future, please consider doing so tonight. My crack staff has given me a list of things to mention. Please, if you haven't already done so, silence your cell phones. First off, I'd like to acknowledge some of the people that we've got here. My predecessor, Major General Mike Myatt. Where are you, sir? Somewhere around here, there, there he is. Thank you. Good. Jan, why did you invite General Myatt? He went to the Norwegian Command and Staff College when he was a younger man, and he speaks Norwegian, right? <laughs> and first off, I need somebody to really critique me tonight, and I've got some big boots to fill, so he was a great guy. So thanks for coming, sir, I appreciate it. We have the Norwegian Consul General and his wife, Anita, Joe Sletback. Where are you, sir? Right here in front. Great, thank you very much. The Australian Consul General and his wife, Christopher Oldfield and his wife, Penny. Right here, thank you. Lawrence McDonald, I don't think I met you. Are you is he here? Yep, over here. Brigadier McDonald's son, and uh, he, he's here with a friend of his, I believe, United States Marine. Tom, thank you for coming as well. Our presentation tonight, about 75 years later on an event that occurred up in Norway. Back then, the Norwegian resistance was busy fighting and, and holding back the Axis powers. There were a lot of other operations that went on, and this is one of the more interesting ones. But as I look past over the history lately, even in this morning's paper as I read about the threats that face Norway today, they're not new to us in the Marine Corps. In 1986, I participated in Operation Northern Wedding Bold Guard in Norway, guarding NATO's northern flank. The Marine Corps currently today has positioned equipment stationed in the caves in Norway, and it's one of our expeditionary programs. And even today, we still face threats in Europe. So that makes our presentation even more relevant. Let me just say a few words about our guest speaker, Brigadier Roderick McDonald. Joined the Army at the age of 16. The Army, the British Army. He learned to be an engineer. He served in three commando brigade, and he commanded a commando squadron in the Falklands in 1982. And I know this means something, that he was mentioned in dispatch for his performance there. And most importantly, he's one of our members and allied members at the Marines Memorial Association. So please join me in a warm welcome for Brigadier McDonald. General Jan and General Mike, thank you. And um, I'd like to repeat my welcome to the Consul Generals, and if, if you don't mind me saying, particularly from Norway. I found that covering this fascinating subject, uh, in order for us to focus and really look at those who took part in the operation, it's best to start by answering three questions. And they're technical questions, but we need to answer them up front. What is heavy water? Why was it important to the Nazi nuclear program? And why, in the 1930s, 
Was it being manufactured in quantity in Norway, Wehrmark, Norway, and nowhere else? In 1931, an American chemist, Harold C. Uri, confirmed the discovery of the heavier isotope of hydrogen, deuterium. For this, he won the Nobel Prize in 1934. In short, light hydrogen in what we know as water, or you would say water, The H in H2O is a proton with an electron buzzing around it. Heavy hydrogen, or deuterium, is a proton and a neutron with an electron buzzing around it. H2O and D2O both look like water, but D2 is twice as heavy as H2, hence the term heavy water. Ice, made of heavy water, D2O, will sink in normal water, H2O. Heavy water is naturally found in every seven thousandth part of normal water. You all have approximately seven grams of heavy water in your bodies. Around the same time, it was discovered that heavy water was an excellent moderator or enabler for nuclear reactors. It allows plutonium to be bred from natural uranium, bypassing the need for expensive enrichment facilities. You need plutonium to make an atomic bomb. Most nuclear scientists in the 1930s believed that heavy water was a better moderator than graphite, which could only be used in a highly refined pure form. In short, heavy water was considered essential if you were going to make an atomic bomb. In the 1900s, in the early 1900s, there was concern about the future productivity of worldwide agriculture. Chilean nitrate deposits, the basis for fertilizer, were running out. Later, it was discovered that nitrate fertilizer, potassium nitrate, could be made from combining ammonia with nitric acid. Ammonia is made from hydrogen and nitrogen. Passing an electric current, electrolysis, through water makes hydrogen. And nitrogen can be separated from air, again using large amounts of electricity. Norway is a beautiful country with mountains, lakes, and waterfalls an ideal location for hydroelectricity. In 1911, Norsk Hydro completed a huge hydroelectric facility on the side of the Morna River Gorge in Telemark, Norway. The power plant was located at Vermorg and the fertilizer plant at Rukon, where most of the workers lived. At that time, Vermorg was the largest hydroelectric plant in the world and a huge source of pride for the newly independent May 17th, 1905 country of Norway. When a large electric current passes through water, normal light hydrogen is separated or boils off. And it does this before the heavy hydrogen or deuterium. If this process is repeated many times, the density of deuterium in the remaining water increases. Norwegian engineers had, somewhat by chance, in the production of nitrate fertilizer, worked out how to produce heavy water as well. In 1934, Norsk Hydro built the first commercial heavy water plant at Vermorg exploiting the huge amounts of available electricity. They became the first major producer of heavy water anywhere in the world. It wasn't long before French, German, American, and British nuclear scientists began vying for supplies of heavy water. And um, if you look at the, sc the screen here, this is the Wehrmorg plant. And this building here, which doesn't exist anymore, is what we're going to refer to as the hydrogen building. That's where the heavy water plant was manufactured and stored. Life, Hans, Larsen Tronstadt, 
later awarded the DSA and OBE, was a Norwegian scientist, intelligence officer, military organizer, and gifted leader. He was instrumental in the design and construction of the heavy water plant at Wehrmorg. When Germany invaded Norway in 1940, Tronstadt was a professor of chemistry at the Norwegian Institute of Technology at Trondheim. He was also an officer in the Norwegian army and a key organizer in the resistance against German occupation. A year later, he fled to Britain with the Germans hot on his heels, leaving his wife and two children behind in Norway. Tronstadt arrived in Britain with detail of the Wehrmacht plant and the German plan to increase the supplies of heavy water. It didn't take long for the British to realize Tronstadt's extraordinary knowledge, intellect, and capability. He became a British Army commando in, in Norwegian independent Company One, known as Company Linga, and an important leader with SOE, that's the Special Operations Executive. SOE was the British equivalent of the two years later formed American OSS. After World War II, the OSS would become the CIA and the British would disband SOE. Tronstadt was also a scientific advisor to the British nuclear program, program codenamed Tube Alloys, which later merged with the US Manhattan Nuclear Development Project. No one was more instrumental in the fight to prevent Germany obtaining heavy water than Tronstadt. Tronstadt proposed the idea of parachuting Norwegian commandos from Company Linga into Telemark to destroy the German heavy water plant at Wehrmorg. He chose men who could live, fight, and survive in the mountains. They were all superb skiers. A note on this map, Rukon, Stavanger, and Egersund. Tronstadt's plan was overruled by combined operations in the British War Office in London who controlled the British Army commandos. They opted for a glider-borne mission codenamed Freshman. This only required four of Tronstadt's Norwegian commandos to carry out the Pathfinder part of the operation, which was called Operation Grouse. 75 years ago, on November the 19th, 1942, at 1750 hours, a Royal Air Force four-engine Halifax bomber from 38 Group Royal Air Force lumbered down the runway of Skitton Airfield in the north of Scotland, towing a Mark I horse glider loaded with young British Airborne Royal Engineers heading for Telemark in Norway. Ten minutes later, another combination followed. Operation Freshman, the first attempt to prevent Nazi Germany developing the atomic bomb had been launched. Waiting for them in Norway were Tronstadt's Norwegian commandos, the Grouse Group. All had grown up in the Telemark area of Norway, which included Rukon and Wehrmorg. The Grouse leader was Jens Alton Paulsen, a tall, thin Norwegian professional soldier. Other members of the Grouse group include Arne Hellstrup, Knut Haugland, another professional soldier who fought German paratroopers at Narvik. Haugland was a highly trained military signaler and an expert in radio communications. The last member of the group was Klaus Helberg, a professional mountain guide and ski instructor. The Telemark region of Norway includes the Hardangervida, a huge high plateau famed for its beauty and brutal winter weather. You can also see on the maps the town of Rukan and Wehrmorg, which is where the heavy water plant was located. A month before Freshman launched on October the 18th, 1942, Grouse had parachuted onto the Harangavida, landing many miles away from their intended drop zone. For three weeks, they skied and dragged their equipment through soft, wet snow and across rivers that had not yet frozen. You can see their route in yellow on the map. After struggling through appalling conditions, they finally arrived at the cabin near Wehrmorg on November the 5th, 1942. 
There they met up with Einar Skinnerland. He had escaped to Britain from Rukon, but was parachuted back into Telemark after 10 days of intensive training by the SOE. He was now an SOE agent. Einar, who would remain in Norway for the rest of the war, was to play a critical role in every heavy water ground-based operation. The Grouse Group found a suitable landing site for gliders as close to Wehrmark as possible. As pathfinders, their first task was to guide the bombers and gliders to the landing site, which they would mark with lights. On November the 19th, Knut Haugland, that's the radio operator, heard the code word girl on his radio, which meant Operation Freshman was on for that night. Haugland set up a homing Eureka beacon to transmit a signal to the Rebecca receivers in the British Halifax towing aircraft to guide them to the landing site. Once the British airborne engineers landed on the Hardangervita, the Norwegian commandos of the Grouse Group would lead them to the bridge over the gorge cut by the Morna River. You can see a frozen waterfall behind the bridge that would be a marker on a future climbing video. The bridge was the only road entrance to the Norse Hydro Vermork plant. And you can see the bridge down here. From there, the British would have to fight their way into the plant, destroy the stocks of heavy water and all the equipment used in its manufacture. This would be the first British airborne operation to use gliders, and it turned out to be the longest glider tow of World War II. The selected parachutists were, were volunteer parachutists chosen from sappers. Now, sappers is a military term for combat engineers of the 9th Field Company Airborne and 261st Field Park Company Royal Engineers. The combined operations planners believed the raid would need only one glider load of 17 sappers. To ensure success, they doubled that number to two fully loaded gliders. The after-raid escape plan was sketchy at best. The raiders were to ditch their British uniforms, disguise themselves as Norwegians, and escape 250 miles across the snow-covered mountains to Sweden. They were taught a few simple Norwegian phrases and ordered to shave any moustaches and grow their hair long <laughs> to blend in with the Norwegians. This is not difficult for British Army officers who grow, who grow their hair long anyway, as you'll see in a later climbing video. With the British sappers inability to ski, Tronstadt and the Norwegians remaining behind in the UK thought that Freshman was a suicide mission. In the worsening weather, the young airborne sappers were bumped around in their gliders in the air. Although it was dark, they could see each other's faces and they were trying hard not to show fear. Many yawned, others felt airsick, longing for the moment they would leave the glider for the fresh Norwegian mountain air. They did not know that far worse was yet to come. They had not heard of the Commando Befehl, Hitler's commando order, issued on October the 18th, 1942, just one month before they took off. He had directed that all Allied commandos encountered by German forces in combat should be killed immediately without trial, even if they were in uniform. The Rebecca receiver in the first Halifax tow plane was unable to pick up the signal sent out by Haugland's Eureka Beacon. As a result, the Royal Air Force crew had to try finding the landing area at night, navigating only by map an impossible task in the ever deteriorating Norwegian weather. On the ground, Haugland, the radio operator, picked up the tow plane's Rebecca signal in his Eureka beacon, and he heard the drone of an aircraft in the sky. He shouted to Paulson, who, with the other men, illuminated the landing site. On the second attempt to find the landing area, ice had formed on the Halifax, its bucking glider, and the tow rope. The tow rope snapped, freeing the glider, which crash-landed in the dark, some 20 miles from Stavanger, killing three of the 17 men on board. Local Norwegians sheltered and gave medical attention to the injured sappers. Before the Germans arrived, 24 hours later, 
All the documents and maps from the crash had been burned. The German troops, which included Waffen-SS, took the survivors prisoner. The second combination fared even worse. They managed to reach the coast of Norway, but due to severe weather, the second Halifax released its glider at considerable altitude in high winds. In, in rain and hail, the second Halifax crashed into a Norwegian mountain near the coast and all on board died instantly. On discovery of the wreck, the Germans threw the bodies of the crew into a nearby bog. The second freed glider spiraled out of control, crashing into the mountains 43 miles from Stavanger and 150 miles from the landing site. Seven men were killed instantly and many more seriously injured. The survivors, unwilling to leave the wounded, sought help while burning all sensitive documents. Eventually, the Germans arrived. They took them to a camp near Ergesund, and later all were taken to a nearby wood and shot. Their bodies were thrown into an unmarked grave. Local Norwegian civilians tended the grave until the end of the war. The Gestapo tortured the injured survivors from the first glider. They killed three of the injured men by injecting air into their bloodstream. The fourth was shot in the back of the head and their bodies dumped into the sea. The remaining five uninjured sappers were held at Greeny concentration camp west of Oslo until January the 18th, 1943, when they too were taken into nearby woods and shot. I laid flowers on their memorial during the reactment of the raid for television in March 1983. The British thought they had burned all the maps, but one in the second glider was overlooked. When the Germans found it, they were able to identify Wehrmacht as the target. The Grouse Group, having heard a tow plane and glider combination for a second time with no response, realized something had gone disastrously wrong. On instructions from Transat in London, they slipped away into the heart of the Hardangavida to try to survive and continue to send intelligence back to Tronstadt in London. For security reasons, their group was renamed Swallow. Operation Freshman, the first Allied attempt to prevent the Nazis developing an atomic weapon had been a total failure. All of the young airborne engineers, along with their glider crews, and one Halifax Royal Air Force, Royal Canadian Air Force crew were dead and worse, the Germans now knew the Norse hydro plant at Wehrmacht was the target. Since its inception in 1901, there have been 29 German Nobel laureates in physics and chemistry, including Werner Heisenberg in 1932 for the creation of quantum mechanics. Twelve of these German Nobel Prize winners were Jewish. They were driven out or chose to leave Germany around the time Hitler was elected to office in January 1933. The scientists attempting to leave Germany in 1933 included the genius Albert Einstein. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the FBI, tried to block Einstein immigrating into the United States. This was the time of America first in the USA with many anti-Semites and Nazi sympathizers in senior positions in the administration. Thanks to Raymond Geist, the American Consul General in Berlin, J. Edgar Hoover was thwarted in his efforts to block Einstein's immigration to the US. Einstein with his wife were granted US residency in October 1933. In 1939, Werner Heisenberg was asked to join the Uranium Club, led by Kurt Diebner, a modestly capable but driven German scientist and Nazi party member. The mission of the Uranium Club was to build an atomic bomb. Heisenberg was promised every resource needed. He asked for heavy water, a lot of it. On August the 2nd, 1939, a letter co-signed by Albert Einstein was sent to President Roosevelt warning Germany might develop an atomic bomb. 
The letter suggested the U.S. start its own nuclear program, and this contributed to the creation of the Manhattan Project. However, J. Edgar Hoover managed to block Einstein's security clearance, so he was not allowed to contribute to the program. The scientific director of the Manhattan Project would be our own J. Robert Oppenheimer, a brilliant UC Berkeley professor of physics of German Jewish descent. Los Alamos was constructed under his guidance, and from 1942 onwards, he would manage more than 3,000 people. Despite all he contributed to the war effort, including his success in building the U.S. atomic weapon, in 1954, J. Edgar Hoover and the McCarthy anti-communist witch hunt would strip him of his security clearance. The questions facing both President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill were not just how to build an atomic bomb themselves, but how to stop Germany doing the same. The answer was to halt the supply of heavy water from Wehrmorg. The failure of the Freshman operation put the Allies in a very difficult position. An idea to bomb Wehrmorg by night by the Royal Air Force had been discounted due to the inaccuracies of bombing, the likelihood of high civilian casualties, and uncertainty that even if the hydrogen building was hit, the heavy water plant deep inside might not be damaged. Nevertheless, General Leslie Groves, the abrasive, egotistical chief of Manhattan, was arguing strongly for a massive bomber raid by the U.S. 8th Air Force. Tronstadt, an SOE, argued against bombing, promoting instead Tronstadt's original plan not using Norwegian commandos. The Grouse Swallow team was already on the Hardangervida. Combined operations in the War Department sided with Tronstadt and the SOE. The next phase was known as Operation Gunnerside. Tronstadt was eager to lead the group, but the British, who felt he was far too valuable to risk, denied his request. Tronstadt selected 23-year-old Second Lieutenant Joachim Ronneberg from Company Linger. It was an inspired choice. Young Ronneberg turned out to be a wonderful leader. Tronstadt named the older and more experienced Knut Haugelid born in Brooklyn, New York, of Norwegian parents, as second in command. Haukelid, who bore a striking resemblance to the actor Humphrey Bogart, was an old friend of Tronstadt's. He was the only Gunnerside member who knew Telemark like a native, having moved there from America when he was only two years of age. Back on the Hardangervida, Swallow was in serious trouble. The Hardangervida in winter as our Norwegian friends know, is a challenging place to survive even for the most experienced mountaineers. Even Roald Amundsen, the famous Norwegian explorer who was first to complete the Northwest Passage and the first to the North Pole, almost died on the Hardangervida while training for an expedition. Having eaten all their supplies, the Swallow Group was slowly starving to death. The wind direction and severe weather had driven the reindeer away, leaving them to survive on reindeer moss, fine for reindeer, but not for humans. Some members of Swallow were so sick they could hardly move to charge the batteries needed to keep Knut Haugeland's radio alive. They were heartened to hear from Tronstadt about their role in the pending gunnerside operation. Luckily for Swallow, on December the 23rd, Paulson was able to shoot a reindeer. Swallow, on the Hardangervida since October the 18th, was going to survive. It was now February 1943. Back in the UK, Gunnerside was ready to go, but the weather wouldn't cooperate. Several times, Gunnerside would load into a bomber, only to return because of the weather. They were as frustrated as Swallow, who would several times set up their Eureka beacon and lights to mark the drops that never came. At 19.10 hours, at 7.10 for those of you who are not Marines, on, on February the 16th, 1943, Gunnerside departed Tempsford Airfield, one of the most secret airfields of the war. It was the home of the RAF Special Duty Squadrons that supported SOE. Ronneberg 
calmly informed the pilot that he wanted to help navigate. And if they were roughly in the area, no matter what the weather was, they were going to drop. Just before midnight, the pilot gave the 10 minute warning. Two minutes after midnight, Gunnerside dropped with all their equipment. All landed without injury. They located all their equipment after chasing one of their containers for a mile. They had no idea where they were. Strohaug, the strongest skier in the group, found a cabin a mile away. They made the cabin into a base to sort out their equipment and catch a little sleep. Estimating their position incorrectly, they set out eastwards at 1800 hours, but after four miles, bad weather forced them to turn back. Struggling directly into a gale force blizzard in the dark, they knew if they missed the cabin, they were going to die. Back at Swallow's cabin, closer to Vermork, Paulson was worried. He had laid out the beacons and heard the drone of the aircraft, but saw no sign of a plane or parachutist. Now the weather was deteriorating rapidly. Their cabin was almost buried in snow and huddled in their sleeping bags with the weather getting worse. They sh shivered and they feared for the Gunnerside group. Luckily for Gunnerside, Ronneberg skied precisely on a compass bearing directly back to their hut. The blizzard prevented Swallow and Gunnerside from moving for f the next four days. All members of Gunnerside became ill from the swift change in weather. On February the 22nd, the storm cleared as quickly as it started. As Gunnerside were preparing to leave their hut, they spotted a skier pulling a polk, that's a sledge, coming directly towards them. They hid, guns drawn. The skier came closer and closer and directly to the hut. As he opened the door, the Gunnerside group jumped him. After determining he was unlikely to be a Quisling, named after the Norwegian Nazi who was running the Norwegian public government, they decided to chance enlisting his help. Christian Christiansen turned out to be a local hunter who knew the countryside well. He agreed to lead them to the rendezvous with the Grouse Swallow team. The Gunnerside group, led by Christiansen, headed out carrying heavy rucksacks and dragging polks. By the way, in this video from the 40th uh, reenactment, I am the skier with the dark belt end hanging down in front of me. After a day of skiing across the Hardanger Vida, they spotted two skiers. They hid, fearing them to be German Gebirgsjäger or ski troops. But on closer inspection, Haukelid, I know it's a little confusing with all this Haukelid and Hauklands and Helbergs, but <laughs> Haukelid managed to spot uh, Haukeland. The Gunnerside and Swallow teams had met. They were ecstatic. They released Christensen with the promise he was to keep the news of what he had seen to himself. The newly enlarged Gunnerside team now discussed how they were going to attack the plant at Wehrmorg. Tronstadt had advised them to climb down into the gorge, cross the river on the ice floes, and scale the cliffs on the other side. But Ronneberg favored the original freshman plan of fighting their way across the bridge, doing the job, as he called it when I met him in 1983, and then fighting their way out. Helberg, the local mountain guide, thought otherwise. He asked Ronneberg if he could ski down into the gorge and see if a covert approach was possible. Ronneberg agreed and let him go. On his return, Helberg assured the team he had found a way down into the gorge a place to cross the river and a way up the cliff on the other side that did not require ropes. Ronneberg taught to each one individually and then allowed them to vote. They decided on the covert climbing assault. Even with the idea of a covert entry, the raiders believed that once the charges exploded, their chances of escape were minimal. This was going to be a one-way operation. That night of Sunday, February the 28th, 1943, 
nine Norwegian commandos set out, leaving Haugland and Skinnerland to maintain radio communications with the SOE in London. Ronneberg was impressed by the way Helberg led the group at night from the Vida across the main road, the red route on the map, avoiding German military vehicles down the slope with trees on one side and across the river, even though the ice was breaking up. On the map, you can see the red route into the plant, the green escape route for the Norwegian commandos, and the yellow British commando reenactment route. And across here, this is the bridge. When we carried out the reenactment of the raid in 1983, the film cameras were placed on the bridge. We had to climb a steep snow face directly under the plant. We opted to do so, the same as the original raiders, and climb without ropes. I have to be honest, this was a hair-raising climb, as you can see from this video. An enormous frozen waterfall, about 30 foot across and about 50 foot high. Incredible steely blue. It's just like a cathedral against the rock. Corporal Nicol ahead of me, kicking the steps in. I'm getting steeper. Very soft snow. Very rotten. Toes down. Hands down. Climb on three points. The climb up the far side was close to the raider's limit, with some slipping at times. Most agreed it was best not not to look down. At the top, Haukelid's covering group took the lead along the railroad track to a large steel gate locked by a chain and padlock. Haukelid cut the chain and they were through into the main area of the plant. Haukelid's covering group took position covering the German guard huts while Ronneberg's demolition party sneaked forward past the guard hut towards the heavy water plant. The door they expected to be open was closed so the group split up into pairs as planned, finding different ways into the plant. Ronneberg and Kaiser crawled through a cable duct. Stromsheim and Idland found their way through another side window. Almost shooting each other when they met in surprise on the inside, the demolition team swiftly disabled a Norwegian night worker in the heavy production plant. They set the explosive charges exactly as they had practiced over a hundred times in the UK and they laid out a two-minute fuse. At the last minute, Ronneberg decided to change the delay to 30 seconds to lessen the chance of the fuse being found and cut before it ignited the charges. Leaving a Thompson submachine gun behind to convince the Germans it was the British and not Norwegians who had carried out the operation, they scrambled out of the plant. Just outside the plant, but before they reached Halkley's covering group, there was a muffled roar. They all lay still. A German guard came out of the hut to look around. Perhaps thinking it was one of the regular avalanches that often roared in the valley, or an animal setting off a landmine, he returned to the hut. The gunner side team could not believe their luck. The raiders departed the way they came along the railway line as the first siren went off, they slid down the cliff face. They crossed the Morna River with the ice flows breaking, and they climbed up the tree-covered slope on the other side. Over the road they went, and up the mountain slope that led to the expanse of the Haranga Vida, fear of capture driving their exhausted bodies on. The Germans were furious. How had these British commandos entered the plant, and what inside help had been given? They swiftly rounded up every Norwegian that had been on their watch list, inc including all of Einar Skinnerland's family. They sent their finest mountain troops into the Hardangavida to burn every hut and search for the raiders. Gunnerside split into three groups. Ronneberg, with the main group, left ski 400 kilometers, 250 miles, across the Hardangavida to neutral Sweden. Haukelid, had previously agreed with Tronstadt, he was going to remain in Telemark with Einar Skinnerland to set up a new resistance group. A third group with Helberg 
and Paulsen headed for Oslo. Ronneberg left a message for Haugland that they had destroyed the plant and been able to get in and out without being discovered. They had suffered no casualties. When Haugland radioed the news to Tronstadt in London, SOE was ecstatic with joy. The news was swiftly relayed, as good news tends to be, to Churchill and to President Roosevelt and General Groves in the USA. Three weeks later, on March the 22nd, Helberg decided to return to the hut on the Hardangervida. His timing was not good. Four or five German Gebirgsjäger skied towards the hut where he was staying, and he was only armed with a Colt 32 pistol. Helberg broke out of the rear of the hut and skied away with at least three Gebirgsjäger in hot pursuit. Like something out of a Hollywood movie, the chase was on. After an hour or so of skiing, up and down hill, two or three pursuing Germans had fallen behind. But the closest Gebirgsjäger was an expert skier using Helberg's ski tracks. He was closing in on Helberg, who turned to face the oncoming German. The German pulled, pulled out his gun and the German fired first. Helberg then fired and the German leaned forward on his ski poles. Helberg, not knowing if he had hit the German and fearing the other Gebirgsjäger would appear at any moment, skied away to freedom. This was not to last for long. He was arrested trying to meet with resistance leaders in a town close to Oslo. He later escaped from a transport taking him to Grinny concentration camp for questioning. A report was sent to Tronstadt that he had been killed trying to escape. However, with the help of loyal Norwegians, Helberg reached Sweden and then the UK some months later. The rest of the team was thrilled when they found he had survived. The Germans set out to rebuild the heavy water pump with even greater capacity. Skinnerland, who was now the main radio contact in the area after Haugland had escaped to Sweden, informed London that heavy water production would be up and running within the next six months. General Groves was furious. This time there would be no escape from US bombing. Without telling Tronstadt or any members of the Norwegian government in exile, but with agreement from the British, the US 8th Air Force launched a series of raids on Wehrmorg and Rukon. Over the period November the 16th to 18th, 1943, 143 B-17 Flying Fortress heavy bombers dropped 711 bombs, of which 600 missed the hydrogen building. 35 B-24 Liberator bombers attacked the hydrogen plant again. However, they mistook the fertilizer nitrate plant in Rukon for the target and attacked that instead. 21 Norwegian civilians were killed. The fertilizer plant, crucial for the Norwegian economy, was destroyed. There was some minor damage to the production equipment, but just as Tronstadt had predicted, the huge stocks of heavy water were untouched. But the raids did have one effect. The Germans had enough of the constant attacks on Wehrmacht and decided to move their entire stocks of heavy water to Germany by railway. The news was relayed to Tronstadt in London. Tronstadt came up with his final plan to put the issue of heavy water to rest. With agreement and support from the SOE, he put Haukelid, who had remained in Telemark, in charge of a Norwegian assault team that he and Skinnerland were to raise from locals to stop the movement of the plant and heavy water to Germany. SOE and its Norwegians in London and Norway looked at many options. They concluded the best way to destroy the shipment, despite the expected Norwegian civilian casualties, was to attack the ferry that would carry the rail cars across Lake Tin. You can see the lake and the ferry route on the map. Explosives were parachuted onto the Hardangervida for Halkalid's team. They discovered the movement details of the train and managed to slip onto the ferry the night before it was due to sail with the Nazi rail cars. Climbing down into the bowels of the ship, Halklid and two other Norwegians placed charges at its weakest point and set the timer to blow at the deepest part of the lake. The next day, they watched the rail cars, loaded with heavy water, roll onto the ferry. At the same time, Norwegian families were walking on board. At exactly the designated time and place, the explosives blew 
the ferry capsized and sank. The entire supply of heavy water and associated production equipment sank with the ferry to the bottom of Lake Tin, along with 63 Norwegian men, women, and children. The heavy water war was over. Tronstadt, Paulsen, Ronneburg, Haukelid, Skinland, and the rest of the Norwegian commandos from Linger Company had succeeded in preventing Hitler from developing an atomic weapon that could have changed the direction of World War II. No one was more instrumental in this process than Tronstadt. Tronstadt still wanted to return to Norway to take part in action on the ground and see his family again. As he had with so many raids in the past, Tronstadt came up with a plan to prevent the Nazis from destroying Norwegian infrastructure before the end of the war. This plan became known as Operation Sunshine. Since the war seemed to be nearing its end, SOE acceded to Tronstadt's request that he command this mission on the ground rather than from London. And October the 4th, 1944, he was parachuted into Norway with his old friend and mountain guide, Helberg. Einar Skinnerland was on the ground to set up the landing lights and meet him. On March the 11th, 1945, a Norwegian Quisling shot and killed Tronstadt. The greatest Norwegian hero of World War II died at the hands of another Norwegian before he could be reunited with his family. At the end of the war, the Norwegian raiders became national heroes. Their stories told multiple times in films, TV docudramas, and books. It never went to their heads. They remained humble to the end. I will leave you with this. On the 40th anniversary of the raid, when we were meeting the raiders and taking part in the reenactment for television, the United States government surprised Knut Halkalid, who had been born in the US, by presenting him with an American passport. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Could you please elaborate a little bit more on the reenactment, your involvement, and what you got from it. And how long did some of those climbs take on the reenactment that got you originally involved with this? Yeah, it was the uh, 40th anniversary of the raids uh, on uh, uh, nine, uh, February 1983. And uh, there was a British television company that wanted to um, do a reenactment for, for television. <laughs> And so they, they asked three commander brigade to, uh, to produce, you know, their best skiers and climbers that they could um, and, and, and do this raid. And, 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 and I wasn't selected because I was, you know, the best skier and climber. I just knew the guy who was organizing it, and his, whose name, interestingly enough, was, was, was Helberg. And he was of Norwegian in, uh, extraction. Uh, but, but not related to the, the famous Klaus Helberg. And we parachuted into the Hardangavida uh, in exactly the same way that uh, the Norwegians did. And, uh, and then we, we, we skied across it with um, he, uh, you know, helicopters and, and um, film crews filming us. When we reached the point where we were going to do the climb, um, we were talking to the raiders the whole time they were with us. Um, the sort of health and safety at work side they said, you, 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 you just, you can't do this climb without ropes. Um, and um, the film crew wanted us to climb a much steeper slope because it was, a, you know, better television. <laughs> and, and of course, all, you know, you can just imagine this, all the Royal, Royal Marines and mountain leaders were, oh no, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. I, I was a little, a, a little worried about it. But, um, but we ended up uh, virtually going on strike and saying, well, look, we're just not going to do it. This is going to look really bad for the Royal Marines and the Commander Brigade if we don't do this. And we were refusing to do it with ropes. So we, we actually did it without ropes. But it, it was a little uh, worrying because you can see the snow was breaking away. Um, it's, it's easier to climb straight ice with an ice axe than, than it is a, a snow face like that. 
Um, and then we got up there. But you know, we were only out on the Haranga Vida for a few weeks. I mean, these guys were there for, for four months. I mean, that's an extraordinary achievement to survive out there. The toughness and you know, willingness to, to take incredible hardship by these Norwegians was just amazing. And to be able to talk to them was just a great honor. And, and they were really humble. Uh, they're all dead now, all dead now. Um, and I just feel really lucky that I had the chance to be with these wonderful human beings. And they were so close together. Um, and you know, Norwegians do things slightly differently to other people. They're, they're very, because of living in that sort of environment, you know, the fact that Ronnie Berg, who was in charge, and don't forget he was a young man, would turn around and allow his guys to vote on what they were. I mean, that's, that would, I don't think that would happen in the US Marine Corps. <laughs> Thank you. Um, obviously, a serious setback for the Nazis when the ferry sank. Had it not been for that, just how close were the Germans to developing an atomic bomb at yeah, that point. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good, it's a, it's a slightly controversial question because, um, you know, if the answer to that is they weren't close, then, you know, you could say it was a waste of time. The fact is that um, threat is a combination of intent and capability. And, and they're multiplied, and that's multiplied together. You think of that as a formula. So if either one of those is zero, there is no threat, right? You might have the capability to do something, but if you've got no intent to use it, then there isn't any threat. Equally, if you want to do something, but you've got no capability, there's no threat. And, and, and the fact of the matter was that the Germans put in a huge amount of effort into producing initially a reactor, because you have to build a reactor first before, you know, to generate the plutonium. And they wanted short-term results. In other words, they weren't patient. If you look at the Manhattan Project, it's an incredible example of, of sort of directional leadership and, and huge resources to, 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 to one end. And General Groves reported directly to the president. And that wasn't the case with the German program. Uh, Kurt, Kurt Diebner, who was, who was the equivalent of, of really Groves, he, he, he was reporting to different people all the time. They kept sh sh moving him from one department to another. Hitler wanted you know, really quick results, so they kept cutting corners. They, they weren't given the resources they had. So they were somewhere away from actually producing an atomic weapon because they just haven't put, hadn't put the resources to it, they hadn't been patient enough. But the fact of the matter was that they really wanted to do it. And if Hitler had done it, you just, it just beggars the imagination, really. Um, and heavy water was essential, and without that, there was no way they were ever going to produce an atomic weapon. Thank you. Um, these were obviously some very tough guys. Yeah. What was their training like then uh, that they had received up to that point, and how does that compare to what you've experienced in your life? Yeah, I, the, the commando training that was carried out in the Second World War was pretty much the same as the commando training that, uh, that exists, exists today. Um, you know, all um, Royal Marine commandos and Army commandos go, go through the same sort of selection, the same sort of training. And certainly the, um, you know, the, the British Royal Marines and the Army Commandos that are part of the Commander Brigade, they specialize in mountain Arctic warfare. And um, through the entire time I, w I was with them over a period of uh, five and a half winters, um, you know, I, I spent in Norway. And, and you're not living in a camp all the time. You're living outside and moving around mostly in the night um, so I would say there's a lot of similarity uh, between 
the way that uh, these Norwegian commandos and the British commandos, because they were part of the army commando organization. Uh, the Royal Marine commandos came along later. Um, it was, I would, I would say, um, as close as it can get. Thank you. Could you elaborate on what security the Nazis actually had in that area at the time? Numbers, troops, order, battle? Um, when, when Freshman was launched, that was the Royal Engineer Airborne Operation, uh, Wehrmacht was very lightly guarded. And if they had managed to get one of those gliders down where the Grouse Group were, it's generally general consensus that they would have succeeded in getting across the bridge and destroying it. Now, they wouldn't have got out. I mean, they would all have, they, it was a suicide mission, but they would have succeeded. After the Nazis discovered that the British were after the Wehrmacht plant, they hugely increased the, the, the guards. They laid mines around the whole area. They brought in um, uh, their, their mountain troops. They, they put extra guards on the, on the bridges. And if freshmen, that's that first raid, had been launched with the second set of defenses, there, there's no way they would have got across. And in fact, if Ronneberg had tried to fight his way across the bridge and get to the plant, he probably wouldn't have made it because they had a very large number of, of, of troops in the area. I, can't, I don't know the exact number. You know, what, what a punch in the gut when, when, when Leif Tronstad was killed, when you dropped that on us in the end. Could you elaborate a little bit more about that and the effect on the, the rest of it? Well, it was, it was extremely sad, um, as I think our Norwegian friends would, would agree. Um, Tronstad uh, grabbed hold of a... Um, one of the uh, Norwegian police who was sort of doing the work for the Germans. And they had taken him away because they wanted to make sure that all the key uh, infrastructure points in Norway were, were not destroyed by, by the Germans. So he, he wanted to know what the guard position was on these areas. And, and they took this guy away. And what they didn't realize was his brother was actually following them. And, and his brother broke into the hut where they were holding, holding this guy and, um, and shot and killed Tronstadt. I mean, that was, it was a real shock for, for everyone. I don't know if you would like to enlarge on that at all, uh, Jan. Don't know if you know the answer to this one, but uh, was part of the bombing raid to try and drop the mountain, parts of the mountain down on the the uh, plant? Well, yeah, they were, they were trying to destroy the hydrogen building. And, and there's so many myths about bombing. I mean, the idea that, you know, bombing could be accurate uh, in those days. I mean, even today, it's not quite as cracked up to be, I can tell you. Um, uh, you know, it was, it was really area, area bombing. But, I mean, let's, let's be clear about one thing. The US 8th Air Force took incredible casualties in the Second World War. The US 8th Air Force took, took more casualties than the US Marine Corps took in the entire Pacific campaign. And Royal Air Force Bomber Command took twice as many as that. These guys were slaughtered. So while I've glossed over and, 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 and somewhat belittled that bombing raid, I want to make clear that these guys were equally as brave as all the other people who were involved in this operation. And what those bomber crews actually went through day after day, night after night in the case of the Royal Air Force was, was extraordinary. And the likelihood of actually surviving a complete tour was relatively low. Um, you, you didn't mention any ground U.S. forces. Was there any play by the U.S. 99th and separate infantry battalion? Uh, not to my knowledge. Okay. No. Thank no. you. Was one of the members of the Norwegian commando group also a member of Thor Heyerdahl's Kontiki expedition? Yes, it was. Yeah. 
Um, now, you know, we've got to go back to the Hauklid, Haugland, Helberg thing. Let's just, <laughs> just go. Knut Haugland. Haugland, the radio operator on this operation, who I spent quite a lot of time with, actually, when I was over there, probably more time with him than anyone else. An absolutely lovely, charming human being. After this, I don't, have many of you heard of this, this um, the, opera, the Contiki um, expedition? I mean, an amazing thing to, to, to ride that raft right across the um, Pacific. Um, anyway, Haugland was the radio operator on, on that mission. And, uh, you know, you couldn't think of a better person, right, than have him. Well, sir, I want to thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Marines Memorial, which, you know, one of our missions is to educate and commemorate, you know, the service of those who sacrificed so much to defend our nations overall, and it's great to have you as an allied member of the club and everything. I want to thank you for a very stirring presentation on behalf. Now, big applause. Thank you very much.